Well, hello everybody and welcome to St. Mark's Facebook Live uh, Theology on Tap. And we're going to talk about uh, angels and demons this evening. And we're coming up to the Feast of the Guardian Angels. Uh, and uh, we're also going to have the Feast of the Archangels, Gabriel, Raphael, and, and Michael. And so I thought, let's talk a little bit about angels and demons because uh, they are uh, issues, uh, as it turns out, that are live here in our parish. And so let's start with a prayer and we'll st I'll explain some of the piety surrounding angels uh, because uh, I think you'll just find it interesting as you incorporate um, this understanding of the angelic into your own uh, spiritual life. So we'll start in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And we'll pray together. Saint Michael, the archangel, defend us in battle. Be our safeguard against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the heavenly hosts, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world, seeking the ruin of souls. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So I talk about it. Well, you know, it's, I've been a priest uh, 22 years, and I, the year before I was ordained, I was down in Nogales, and, and uh, at Sacred Heart Parish, and just before I left, I got this call about from a lady, uh, Mary Kay, who had just bought a new house that was infested with ghosts. And I thought, you know, I, that was not something we ever talked about in the seminary. And so um, I said, you know, I'd, I'm just a seminarian. I could come over and bless your house, but I'd be shooting blanks, right? Because what you really want is a priest. Uh, and so when I went back to the seminary, I thought, well, gosh, that's interesting. And so you have to do a senior paper. And I did my senior paper on what do you do with someone calls and complains about ghosts. And, you know, ghosts, angels, and demons are not the same, same thing. And it's interesting because the church doesn't uh, talk about it so much. But the world around us, they are definitely into it. And so without going into my long history with all this, I would just say in the last six months, it's either been someone who has come to the office because they had a child who had a rosary that had a snake on the cross instead of the, uh, the corpus, our Lord's corpus. Um, I got called by a great family, these great, three great little boys, um, uh, five to about 18 months old, something like that. And um, the little boys complaining about ghosts. Dad claimed he had scratch marks on the bottom of his feet from the ghost. Mom was very concerned because she had her experiences. Um, people who uh, have uh, prayer experiences where they feel like something is coming out of them that's dark. And, and so uh, it just, it's all around us. And my favorite story is just on the other side of Tangerine from our parish, they did a po big police raid on a house up there. And when they went in there, it was a big drug house. They got automatic weapons, all that stuff. But sprinkled throughout the house were either Santeria shrines or satanic shrines, shrines to Santa Muerte. And then my favorite, and I told this to some people, on the counter was an envelope full of St. Mark the Evangelist parish envelopes, which unfortunately were not open. But the point of it is, was this idea in these people's heads that all of this cultic, occult stuff, and the, they just reduced Christianity to the occult, that it's all just part of, um, of uh, this whole big spiritual world that you can control. And, and that, that isn't what the spiritual world is. And so tonight we're gonna talk about three basic things. We're gonna talk about doctrine, about angels. Um, we're gonna talk about um, the uh, practice of, uh, what is it, I call it, uh, the occult and uh, the, some of the problems with, with the demonic because the devil is real, demons are real, all this stuff is real, but you have to see how it, it fits into, into life. And then I wanna talk about liturgy, and finally, because the best part is to talk about the saints and their struggle with the demonic because it gives us a sense of what, uh, what to expect in our own lives. Uh, so let me just start out by 
by uh, talking about this. How, how do you talk to your kids and grandkids about uh, angels and demons? If you avoid the topic, someone else will fill them in on it. And it may not be what you want them to hear because it could be some of this weird stuff that's out there. It's the same thing like I say when you talk to uh, kids about uh, sex, you know, uh, relations between male and female. You should be the trustworthy voice that tells them the truth. Uh, and in all of these things, tell your kids and grandkids the truth. Then you'll always be a truth teller for them because they're going to have all these other, other influences. And not all of them are from this world, and that's just the truth of it. So let's, let's talk about it. First, angels exist. Before we get into the doctrine, I want to talk why belief in angels is rational. Uh, because what we say is that faith and reason can't be separated. So you can't just believe irrational things. Faith in angels is rational. Now just think of your own experience of life. Is you believe in God because you've tuned into theology on tap, or at least you're open to belief in God. But in your experience in the material world, there's you, there's chimpanzees, there's other mammals, other uh, birds, and there's reptiles, and there's fish, there's microbes, there's the argument I think that I once talked to everybody about, about whether viruses like COVID-19 are alive, because they do have the ability to kind of reproduce themselves using your cells, that's how viruses make us sick. And then you go down to chemicals that react. But there's this sense of this vibrancy to existence. And it goes down to the smallest uh, matter in the world. So do you believe that we're at the top of that chain? There's nothing above us? Because in that fullness that extends from us to the quantum level, what the belief in angels is, is that there are these myriad of spirits that go between us and God. Not all life is embodied. Uh, Plato believed this. Plato made this argument that if you believed in ideas that you could have an idea of a chair, for instance, he called it the form, or at least that's our English translation of it, is that there's no height nor depth and weight to that, yet it exists and it's tremendously influential. And he says, that's, that's what spirits are like. And they do, did believe in spirits. St. Augustine said that the Roman and Greek gods were demons because they were immoral and they made people do bad things and they wanted to be worshiped like they were God. But uh, the belief in the, in the spiritual life is more than just Christians. And it's a, it is a rational uh, understanding of life. So what are you going to do with it? Well, I said that we're going to talk about three things. So let's first talk about doctrine. Okay, angels and demons exist. Um, if you go through the scriptures and uh, you start with the book of Genesis, there's the snake in the garden, right? Uh, that's that's the devil and if you pay attention to the to the temptation isn't the temptation that Adam and Eve shouldn't trust God that he's misleading them that's always the satanic um, and so for instance uh, and we'll talk about portals of dark dark uh, forces into into our lives doorways we leave open on the back of our minds think of someone who's committed a, 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 a grievous sin that's wounded them deeply uh, abortion is a classic one. And so the woman goes to confession, the man goes to confession. Years later, they're confessing it again. Why? Because in the back of their head, there's this voice that's saying, do you really believe God forgave that? Do you really believe that you're lovable? Do you believe that God would actually take someone like you to heaven? That is the satanic, my friend. Anything that gets you to distrust God is the satanic. And that's when we'll talk a little bit about the discernments of spirit, and I'll at least make some recommendations about reading material. But first, let me refresh myself. New Glarus beer from Wisconsin. Came familiar with it when I went into to the seminary. I know many of you believe I never had a drink before I went to the seminary, but let me assure you that was not true. But New Glarus beer is a great beer. It's one of my brother's favorites who has um, the breweries downtown. Okay, so let's start with um, the whole idea of the supernatural world. Remember that angels are all through the Old Testament, right from the book of Genesis. 
Satan, doesn't he, uh, isn't he allowed to tempt Job in the book of Job? Then angels are used as messengers in the book of Judges. They appear to Gideon. They're in Daniel. Israel has an angel. That's where we get Michael. He's the, he's the angel for, that defends Israel. Um, but also, the New Testament is full of angels. It's angels that announce the birth of Christ to both Mary and St. Joseph. They sing at Jesus' birth. They're there when, um, when Jesus is uh, raised from the dead to announce his resurrection. Because the word angel comes from the Greek word angelos, which means messenger. Angels always carry a message um, to people. But Jesus has more to say about that. In the Gospel of Matthew, he says, do not be afraid of those who can kill the body, rather be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. And then he's the one who gives us the teaching about guardian angels. I know you know this. Jesus' admonition is, is don't offend these little ones. The word is the anawim. And it doesn't mean just children. Children are included. But it means the people that don't count. Um, you think they don't count? Well, they count because they have guardian angels that are always talking to God uh, uh, about, about their charge. Because each of us have a guardian angel. If there's two of you sitting on the couch watching this, there are four persons in that room. You and two guardian angels. There could even be some demons floating around. Uh, because the way that we understand it doctrinally is angels cannot take us against our will uh, for good angels. Good angels can only give us inspirations. They can only give us encouragements. Why? Because grace does not destroy nature. Grace doesn't replace nature. Grace does not annihilate nature. Grace builds on nature. And so a guardian angel is always the one that gives you inspirations directed towards the love of God and neighbor. The demonic's a different deal. Uh, the demonic is always about distrust. The demonic is always trying to pull you one degree off devotion to God. Why? When you look at some of the nutty stuff out there about angels and why the Catholic Church should talk about angels is the idea that there is this battle going on all around us. And we're in protected space because we are protected by angels. This is, a, this is a Christian story. This is the book of Revelation, uh, chapter 12, where a, a war broke out in heaven, right? Uh, and there's a woman clothed with 12 stars, clothed with the sun, with a crown of 12 stars. Uh, that is all about this angelic warfare. But it, it's not uh, equally powerful sides. See, the idea of, 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 the, of creation as being neutral territory and the battles of the, uh, God and his army fight Satan and his armies like they're equals, that is not the Christian narrative. So people who tell you stories like that don't listen to it. Those are the people that want to balance off good and evil. That just, that does not work. You cannot balance off good and evil. Remember the story I told you about the drug house up there with the Santa Maria shrine and the dead goat scales and Santa Muerte? and good old St. Mark's envelopes. Well, there's some ideas that you just, you just pay off everybody. It's like paying bribe money. That is not how the world works. Uh, we really are deep in St. Augustine and how St. Augustine explained reality because it's deeply biblical to understand that creation is good. Why? Because on the first six days of creation, doesn't God say that he, he separated and created light, said it was good, separated the waters above from the waters below, said it was good, uh, put uh, some land here and some water there, said it was good, put living things in the water, put uh, creeping things on the land, said it was good. You get my drift. Creation is good. So that is where our theology, if you remember about the creation of Satan and Satan falling, the difference between us and the angels is this, is we have a spirit, a soul, and a body. An angel is a spirit. Why does that make a difference? God's a spirit, and there are two forms of created spirits, angels and human beings. Uh, a spirit is just immaterial existence. Uh, it's 
we, St. Thomas Aquinas, the angelic doctor, um, said that our rational facility, our capacity for reason, was this participation uh, in the life of God because there is divine wisdom in uh, creation. It's why we can do mathematics, but raccoons can't do mathematics. It's why we do physics. Chimpanzees can't do physics. You get my drift? This is a function of the spiritual life. The soul and the body are about our, uh, our material life. So there's a vegetative soul according to St. Thomas Aquinas. It, it, it nourishes itself. There's an animal soul, it's communal. Uh, it takes pleasure, it eats. And then there's the rational soul, which is the human soul. That's why some of the ancients would say the human person is the three-souled creature. Uh, that we're midway in this plenum of existence between God all the way down to the least thing that God, that God has made. But what it means is, is that unlike animals, we're susceptible to spiritual temptation. We learn through our senses, our eyes, our, our hearing, our sense of smell, our sense of taste, and our sense of touch. This is how we learn. Angels don't have bodies, they don't have senses. According to our theology, angels are created, and at the moment of their creation, they're knowing everything they're ever going to know. They're knowing exactly what God put into them. We're the creature that gets to learn it on the way. That's why Jesus is up like a rabbi. We follow behind him. He says the way, the truth, and the life. We follow Jesus. So angels are immensely more intelligent than we are. But they don't learn like we learn. So there's, there's a difference there. What difference does it make? Well, this is the thing. So at the moment of creation, according to our doctrine, they made a choice. They knew everything they were ever going to know. So now's the time to choose. Experience isn't going to mean anything for an angel. And that's where this, uh, this fallen angel comes from. Uh, Lucifer was thought to be a cherubim because in the choirs of angels, the seraphim are the fiery angels that worship before God. The cherubim are the next rank that worship God in truth. And so Thomas Aquinas thought that Lucifer, the light bearer, because light is wisdom uh, in, in the Old Testament. That's where the name Lucifer comes from, light. That um, he chose not God. He didn't like the plan. He had a better plan. And so he sings the discordant notes according to J.R. Tolkien. If you ever read the Cimmerillion, right? He's, uh, he's the angel that starts to sing a discordant note. Which is an interesting aspect of Catholic spirituality. St. John the Cross running through his spirituality, and he's one of the doctors of the church, has this role for Satan in our spirituality. If you were to draw a picture of John of the Cross's spirituality, of you climbing up a ladder to heaven, every inch of the way there's a demon poking you, and there's a guardian angel that's encouraging you. Why? Because at the heart of it is a choice. The angels made it in a moment. We make it through a lifetime. And so we are the place where this battle takes place, where we're made good. That's why when you think about sin, and you think about any time that you have fallen in your life, did you fall because you cackled demonically and thought, this is evil, I get to reject God? Or was it that you saw some good in there? How many times do you have friends that explain why they walk away from the Catholic Church or some moral code because they're serving a higher moral purpose, which they have uh, discerned on their own? Um, because human beings are made for good. Uh, so are angels. And so what's evil? According to St. Augustine, what evil is, is a failure to participate in good. Good is what it means to exist, because God says everything that exists is good. But demons, they don't participate in the good. They cannot not have goodness in them, otherwise they just wouldn't exist anymore. And that's why Jesus says, beware the one who can destroy body and soul uh, when, you go to, when you go to hell, because it becomes this inhuman existence. Sin is to participate in the irrationality of beasts or uh, simply appetites. For the Satan, who does not have a body, he can't fall for 
gluttony or avarice or lust or laziness, right? The only thing he can have is pride, anger, and, and, and which are all we say are the spiritual sins. Which interestingly enough, as we look at demons, excuse me, I need to refresh myself. I hope you do too. Why medieval theologians were interested in angels and demons? Because it was the ability to look at the nature of sin that didn't have anything to do with appetites. And so to try to come up with a way that we sin, and what St. Augustine would say, and really St. Thomas Aquinas built on it, was the idea is that our will wants things that are not good. All sin comes from a defect of wanting. And so, desire. This is why this is important. Think about this in terms of what you've heard about the angelic and the demonic. Um, you know, just the little good angel on this shoulder, the bad angel on this shoulder, the kind of caricature. But the, the idea of the, what evil does is that evil, you are inspired to do something wonderful and good. But then you start saying, oh, I can't really do that. I ought not to do that and you rationalize away why you don't do it. Well, that's the fight between good and evil, doing something that's good for God or something that's a little less. Um, it's mediocrity in the prayer life. Um, if you watch Bishop Barron's thing about the seven lively virtues, seven deadly sins, uh, the idea of sloth, the sedia, the noonday devil, the demonic, that just wants you to just like relax, it's gonna be okay, don't worry about anything. Don't do anything. Well, Jesus talks about that as the road to hell, doesn't he? Um, that the uh, road to heaven, that's a little steep little trail and it's narrow, you better stay on it. But there's something always trying to pull you off it. And so this idea of desire uh, in our will, that we desire good things, but that our desire can be corrupted. Um, corrupted, in, at least in uh, uh, one of the ways that Satan works on us, is that it, he makes us want lesser goods. Um, it's not, I will either give my life to love of the poor or I will worship Satan and I will blah, blah, blah. That's never it. Uh, it's always putting off today, what, uh, putting off to tomorrow some charitable act that should be done today. Um, that's how we are just get worn out or getting caught up in these uh, nonsensical arguments, these abstractions that don't have any practical effect because it's work desire that allows the satanic into our lives. And so when you talk to people who do exorcisms, and I, I chatted around a little bit with uh, some people, and what they say is, what they're looking is for is for portals. So, for instance, um, uh, do you find a desire to do the occult? So, I, the, one of the, uh, people, the staff members said, "You got to tell them that story." So, when I was in, I think probably sixth grade or seventh grade, something like that, I went over to my friend Mike's house, and uh, he had this game that was a Ouija board. I never knew what a Ouija board was, but we sat down and uh, we read the instructions. We put our hands on that little marker on it, if you know what a Ouija board is. And he asked the Ouija board, uh, does Sally like me? I think her name was Sally Cool, but I could be wrong on that. But I remember it was Sally. And so the little thing starts to move. I said, I'm not moving that. <laughs> Why? <laughs> e. <laughs> yeah, yes, yes. What could it possibly mean? Well, Mike did get married. They did get married to Sally. So I don't know how true it is. You go down to some of the Mexican markets, my favorite one, I love it, is El Heredero at the corner of uh, Prince and uh, La Canada. Is you walk out past the, um, the uh, checkout station and it's a wall full of tarot cards. Uh, I have my sister-in-law had a friend who read tarot cards that told me I was getting married to have a big family. Well, I married the church, I, I, I married Christ, and you're all my family, so it must have come true, right? But that is kind of the harmless idea about it all. But what happens if you start taking it seriously? Uh, you're disappointed in love, so you go to a curandero, or you go to one of these palm readers, or something like this. 
And you begin to actually put your trust in that and not in God and grace unfolding in your life. What you've opened up is a door for the influence of evil. That's the problem with being a cult. Um, to play with an eight ball and ask a question, you know, uh, what's a good question? Will it be Pac-12 football, Pac football this year? Could be, it says right there in the eight ball. You know, you're not living your life around it. It's when your desires buy into it and you are drawn deeper into that world. That's when the occult gets very dark. And so I remember some lady came to see me and because uh, there was the occult, the neighbors next door, and there were these things happening in this house. This stuff actually happens. And so I gotta say, I don't get too excited about that kind of thing. But I asked her, are you going to mass? No. You're saying your prayers? No. Try another Christian life? I say, what good would it have to have me come out and bless your house? I'm not a witch doctor. Because that's the answer to evil. Live the life of grace. Say your prayers. Go to Mass. Stay close to the sacraments. Live a moral life. Care for your brothers and sisters. Doesn't mean you're going to avoid temptation. You're going to have temptation. That's the way it goes. But we, they can't touch us. Evil can't corrupt our souls if we're focused on trying to make Please God. And this is the whole idea of uh, discernment of spirits. A uh, good book on discernment of spirits by uh, Father Timothy Gall Gallagher. Very approachable for people. Uh, I'm not a huge, um, uh, what do I say? Am I an expert on angels and demons? My friends, there are no experts on angels and demons. There just aren't. All we have is what Jesus tells us. Avoid the demonic. Uh, trust in your guardian angel. Because we feel he rose from the dead. He's the son of God. He knows what he's talking about. But in the discernment of spirits, it's the idea of trying to understand what your desires are leading you to. And so this really is rooted a lot in St. Ignatius Boyle and his spiritual exercises. Why I recommend that book on discernment by uh, Father Timothy Gallagher. Uh, really easy to understand. Uh, but the idea of, of trying to figure out what your desires mean. And so for St. Ignatius, his famous story is, when he'd read books about saints, they didn't feel good. And even after he finished reading them and put them down, it still felt good to think about it. He'd read stories of knights and daring dudes and all these love affairs, and they were really excited to him. He felt good about it. But 10 minutes later, not so much. You know, he's just kind of, uh, okay. Um, well, you, the goodness in you is reacting to God. So think about it this way. In your life, there are impulses that come from God that are communicated to you from your, to your guard, by, by your guardian angel who cannot make you do anything. He can't walk the walk for you, but he can give you inspirations. You also have your own human impulses because you have all these appetites or you have people you don't like. You have all these uh, things that are good in your life you like to have a meal with your family, and you like to have three chocolate fudge brownies with uh, two helpings of ice cream. Um, that's kind of how we're built. It's the demonic that gets into the appetites. That's the first line of defense for us. Because the demonic, if they get into the appetites and get you into addictions, lust and pornography, gluttony, greed, these become portals just like the occult is a portal. It's why what your defenses have to include is paying attention to a good moral life and, uh, and confession. Uh, it's a matter of doing maintenance on your soul and building uh, these defenses against the evil. One of the things I was told that was a portal is sometimes for people who are abused because one of the, uh, one of the effects of abuse, especially se uh, sexual and physical abuse in the family, is it creates this deep distrust that can easily be transferred to God. And that can lead to probably things that you've heard about. Possession, um, which happens. Oppression, which is uh, like depression, where you constantly feel like you're under assault. Or obsession, oppression and obsession. But obsession is you're constantly worried about uh, demons. We'll talk about that a little bit, because St. Therese of Lisieux, he just puts the knife into it. 
Why she was not like that. With love, she explains why you should not allow yourself to be oppressed by evil. So possession, we always talk about it, possession, uh, the movie The Exorcist, um, and the problem is Hollywood dramatizes this stuff, and so it becomes this over-the-top nonsense. But uh, my understanding is for exorcists and every diocese has one, is that you look at what the indicators are of, of demonic possession. So you know a language you shouldn't know. You have an aversion to sacred things. You have um, a, a strong, uh, like a more strength than what you should have uh, for a, 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 a little kid. And um, uh, there's one other one, I just can't pull it off on the top of my head, which is, sorry, I can't help you on that one. Uh, but it'll probably come up if I remember it. Uh, but uh, what I'd say is you listen to that kind of stuff from people. But uh, that is rare, but apparently it actually does happen. And it, that's a real battle. Um, uh, obsession, infestation is, is when you just allow evil into your life. You have a series of shallow relationships. You abuse drugs and alcohol. All of these kinds of things are all these portals. So why the moral life is important for the integrity of the soul? Because if you just think about a fractured personality, you have all these little cracks uh, and wedges to work in. And if how the demonic actually works is to make you distrust God. Well, why give the devil an in? And so let's see as we go through all of this. Um, and so I wanted to talk about liturgy. So you probably have heard of the liturgical prayer, Eucharistic prayer number one, where the priest bows down and says, may your angel in heaven take this gift to heaven. Um, so the angels are invoked always in, in the liturgy because um, Jesus rose from the dead. He reveals as a matter of divine revelation that the world is like this, that we have more influences in our life uh, than just good friendships and bad friendships. Um, and so liturgically, uh, we always invoke the angels. And here's the second thing, is to, we'll end up tonight with the prayer to our guardian angels, angel of God, my guardian dear. You know that prayer goes back to the 13th century, based on prayer that goes back to the fourth century, um, because of the sense of a piety that takes you to talking not just to angels, uh, I mean, and saints, but you know, especially your guardian angel. Uh, there is this thing that really comes into the Protestant world uh, that says, hey, I just go directly to God. Hey, good for you. Um, but why wouldn't you pay attention to the world as Jesus describes it? Um, and so um, in the book of Revelations, chapter 4 and 5, it's all about liturgy, right? And the saints uh, praying to God. Um, guardian angels about saints that report to God. Uh, Jesus say, with two or three, ask, you know, uh, gather, I'll be there in your name, whatever what two or three of you ask for, you know, it will be granted. The idea that God is gathering his people in. And liturgical prayer is always the prayer of community. Uh, we are not lone rangers when it comes to the spiritual life. And so um, that's the Angela Day, the uh, uh, prayer to your guardian angel. Um, the other prayer is the St. Michael the Archangel prayer that we started with at the beginning of this theology on tap. And that actually was first put out in 1884 when Pope Leo III, 1886. In 1884, Pope Leo III uh, made as part of the Catholic liturgy what are called the Leonine prayers. At the end of the Mass, the priests and the altar servers, deacons and subdeacons, go in front of the altars and they pray the Leonine prayers. And the original Leonine prayers were the protection of the Holy See from the Italian state uh, and the integrity of the Holy See. Two years later, he, uh, he added that St. Michael, the Archangel prayer, which was removed at the Second Vatican Council as part of the liturgy because the Second Vatican Council uh, thought that the liturgy was just getting overwhelmed with symbol upon symbol and the essential nature of the, sin of the liturgy, word and sacrament was being obscured by all the other uh, moving parts of the liturgy. So it was a judgment they made at that council. 
But Pope Francis has encouraged all Catholics to, when they pray the rosary, um, to pray the, the prayer of St. Michael the Archangel, has encouraged everybody to pray the Angela Dei, De, De, which is angel of God, my guardian dear, to whom God's love commits me here, ever this day be at my side, to light and guard, to rule and guide. Uh, one little thing, I thought this was interesting. Have you heard that people want to name their guardian angels? So the Vatican actually made a statement and said, please don't do that. Is um, guardian angels are immensely more powerful and intelligent than you are. Please don't treat them like they're a pet. Um, angels are warriors and there's a war going on. So to call them Fido, Spot or Horatio, whatever the name is, is not appropriate according to the Vatican. There are others that disagree, but this is the Catholic Church. Everybody disagrees with the Vatican. They don't hear what they want to hear. Um, but it is about maintaining reverence for sacred uh, persons. Uh, the Trinity, above all, uh, but angels and saints, right, as, uh, as our reverence. And so I would like to end up uh, my little talk about talking about the saints. And so obviously St. Therese of Lisieux. And her story of the soul, I uh, copied some things out I wanted to read to you about her advice about angels and the Eucharist. This was actually in a letter that she wrote to her cousin Marie. Before you confided in me, I felt you were suffering and my heart was one with yours. Since you have the humility to ask advice of your little Therese, this is what she thinks. You have grieved me greatly by abstaining from Holy Communion, as you have grieved our Lord. The devil must be very cunning to deceive a soul in this way. Do you not know, dear Marie, that by acting thus you help him to accomplish his end? The treacherous creature knows quite well that when a soul is striving to belong wholly to God, he cannot cause her to sin. So he merely tries to persuade her that she has sinned. This is a considerable gain, but not enough to satisfy his hatred. So he aims at something more and tries to shut out Jesus from a tabernacle which Jesus covets. Unable to enter this sanctuary himself, the devil wishes that at least it remain empty and without its God. Alas, what will become of that poor little heart when the devil has succeeded in keeping his soul from Holy Communion? He has gained all his ends. Teresa struggle, uh, St. Therese struggles with scrupulosity. And she saw it as an issue about whether or not she trusted God. And it was really the legacy of Jansenism in France. And that's why uh, people say, the moral theologians say, Therese was the one who put the cock and nail, uh, cock and nail nails in Jansenism. But Jansenism is still alive because it lives in scrupulous hearts. And so here's another one. Remember, little Marie, that this sweet Jesus is there in the tabernacle expressly for you and you alone. Remember that he burns with the desire to enter your heart. Do not listen to Satan, laugh and discord, and go without fear to receive Jesus, the God of peace and of love. In truth, it's impossible that a heart which can only find rest in contemplation of the tabernacle, and yours as such, you tell me could so far offend our Lord is not to be able to receive him. What does offend Jesus? What wounds him to the heart is want of confidence. And that's, she, that's her uh, little way. And uh, why she had a great impact on me when I read her book in my, when I was in my 30s. And then, you know, we just had the feast of St. Padre Pio, St. Pius Pietro Cina on Wednesday. And uh, Therese says that she sees Satan. He's just this ridiculous figure because all of his temptations are absurd to her because she has just given herself to Jesus. Saint Padre Pio battled with Satan. How do you like to live next to a guy that's tearing up his cell every night because he claims that he's in there fighting with Satan? I have no idea what that is um, because most of this battle takes place right up here. But here's what Padre Pio said about this struggle with demons. Jesus permits the spiritual combat as a purification not as a punishment. The trial is not unto death, but unto salvation. John the Cross is born. That uh, temptation is how you build confidence in God. You have to turn your back on him. 
The devil does not want to lose this battle. He takes on many forms. For several days now, he has appeared with his brothers who are armed with batons and pieces of iron. One of the difficulties is that they appear in many disguises. There were several times when they threw me out of bed and dragged me out of my bedroom. I patient, however, and I know Jesus, Our Lady, my guardian angel, St. Joseph and St. Francis are always with me. I had a young lady come and talk to me about middle school, and she was concerned that something evil was following her around the house because she felt very scared when she was alone, and she felt this presence. I once had this experience of that. I was wide awake. I turned around. I'd always heard this story because I was in the seminary of the Carmelites at the time, 18 years old. And I'd always heard about this Carmelite ghost that appears. He was a, he'd been a priest back in Illinois, the whole story. But I turn around, and honest to Pete, standing right next to my bed, this guy in full Carmelite habit holding a clipboard under his arm. He was from here to this iPad from me. And I, I just looked at him and said, what are you doing? Because I thought it was what my roommate in the seminary or uh, one of the other guys we lived with. No response. I said, hey, you're not scaring me. No response. So what do you do? You're 18, you reach out and slug him in the stomach. It was like nothing was there. But uh, I gotta say, it was so real. So what is that? I don't know. I'm not qualified to say what that is. But that caused me concern. And so I always tell kids that I have these experiences too because they're not rare. But here's what I learned when I did that paper. Remember I talked about that paper? Jesuit named Father Thurston. And he said, uh, if it's the devil, uh, he's trying to be attractive. So mostly this isn't the demonic. It is something spiritual though. There's something happening. And it probably has something to do with the souls of the dead. So pray for them. Maybe it's someone's trying to get your attention and pray for them. Who knows? I don't know. I'm not qualified to say. I can just tell you what I've read and what makes sense to me. So I always tell people, eternal rest grant unto them, Lord, let a perpetual light shine upon them. May these souls and the souls of all the faithful departed the mercy of God rest in peace. Amen. And because people do have these experiences, if you don't talk about them, you don't take them seriously, something else will fill that space. And it will not be a good something else, right? And so uh, pray for the dead. Make it a habit. I mean, you talk to young people like that little family I was talking about. You just, you meet them where they're at. Uh, we don't know what these things, uh, what all of this is. We have our doctrine, we have our understanding, but reality is uh, much more complicated than we think it is in my, in my judgment. And so we're gonna bring this to an end, and that was uh, my presentations on angels and demons. Uh, short, stay close to God, talk to your uh, guardian angels, say your prayers, live a moral life, stay close to the sacraments, what do you got to worry about? Any temptations you have, it's just there to make you holy. That's the whole point of it, okay? But you'll have portals where your desires get on something other than God. And you think that lust is going to make you happy or greed is going to make you happy or anger is going to make you happy. Hey, you're just opening the doors to all sorts of dark stuff in your soul. That's really what everybody needs to know about angels and demons. And so I hope that coming out of here, two things. One, you have an appreciation for the reality of angels and demons. And two, in your own personal piety, your, your practice of prayer, uh, that you would actually start to work in uh, the prayer to your guardian angel, and Saint Michael, into your prayer. And so let's close this evening with the prayer to uh, Saint, uh, to our guardian angel. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Angel of God, my guardian dear, to whom God's love commits me here, ever this day be at my side, to light and guard, to rule and guide. And if you're interested in that book, again, about the Sermon of Spirits, Father Timothy Gallagher, it's called The Sermon of Spirits. How can you miss it? It's right on Amazon. It cost you about 10 bucks. And I think uh, you could find it very useful in how you think about uh, your own spiritual life. So let me give you a blessing through the power of the internet. The Lord be with you. Uh, may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Will you get a chance to say a prayer for me? Good night.